to you from the Hudson Media Group Studios. This is Talking Politics, and I am the professor, Fernando Uribe. I hope you all had a wonderful summer, as did I. I feel recharged, and there's a lot to discuss, so let's get started. Here's what I'm thinking about right now. Folks, during the summer, I actually, as many of you know, I love to sort of follow politics at all levels, and I'm sure you do too. But one thing caught my eye, and that was an interview that Piers Morgan did, over, again, over the summer, with nationally syndicated host Ben Shapiro. Now, one of the things that, you know, I'll sort of say right at the onset, I, I've never been a fan of Piers Morgan. I've, I've always looked at him as like one of these condescending Brits that seem to always like look down on Americans and American society. But I have to tell you, even a clock is right twice a day. And I can tell you that watching Piers Morgan really caught my attention. Now, I had to make sure I watched this segment a few times to make sure that my eyes and ears didn't deceive me. But at the same time, I'm glad that it's getting some serious mainstream attention. Because folks, let's be very honest, and we'll sort of get into a little bit of the details of what he discussed, but, and I've talked about it before, and I'll say it again. In many instances, ladies and gentlemen, liberalism is toxic. I'll say it again. Lib liberalism is indeed toxic. Now, I can't think of a better word, and believe me, I have a pretty exceptional vocabulary. So if you can think of one, I'm all ears. But trust me, you'll know where I'm coming from. Now, let me be very clear about something, because as you know, I'm someone who, who identifies as being center-right. And sure, I can lean conservative on many issues, but at the same time, I can be progressive on others, such as LGBT rights, equality in the workplace, as it pertains to income, and of course, holding corporations accountable. But one thing I'll never become is sort of a radical leftist, advocating for social, socialist policies, or anything that resembles these, these sort of obnoxious college professors that we all hear about who are unapologetic leftists. Yes, yeah, sorry, that isn't me, and it never will be. But getting back to Piers Morgan, here are some quotes that should open all of our eyes about what he's exposing in today's political climate. Now, Piers Morgan, without a doubt, identifies as a liberal. But he even said that the reason why populism is on the rise is because, quote, liberals have become unbearable. And I couldn't agree more. Quote, he went on to say, but liberals have become utterly, pathetically illiberal. And it's a massive problem. Like, what's the point in calling yourself a liberal if you don't allow anyone else to have a different viewpoint than your own? You know, sort of like the snowflake culture that we sort of operate in now. It's sort of like the emphasis on victimhood and looking at identity politics at every turn. Sort of the idea that everyone has to think a certain way and behave in a certain way. And to be honest, it's sort of completely skewed, you know, in a way that, guess what? Everyone's offended by everything and no one's allowed to even say a joke. During the interview, Piers Morgan mentioned Kevin Hart, the accredited and widely acclaimed comedian who got booted from hosting the Oscars this year because of a joke he had made years earlier that some considered to be homophobic. Now again, I'm not condoning hom homophobia of any kind, but let's sort of put it into context as well, folks. He noted that there, there is now no host for the televised event, and even the Emmy Awards are now following suit, to, to the extent that he's warning that even the extended consequences of such tactics are not completely healthy. He went on to say also, quote, the liberals get what they want, which is sort of a humorless void where nothing happens where no one dares to do anything or laugh about anything or anyone or behave in a way that doesn't suit that rigid way of thinking. And you know what? Piers Morgan went on to say no thanks. And you know what? I agree with him. Now, while he doesn't agree with the rise of populism, especially in Europe and in his native England, Piers Morgan did understand why people react the way that they do. He also went on to say, quote, liberals get what they want, which is, again, sort of this obsession with PC culture this obsession with identity politics, this obsession with making sure that no one's offended. So what's happening around the world? Again, populism is, is rising because people are fed up with this sort of fixation on PC culture. They're fed up with what's called snowflakery. They're fed up with people being offended by everything and gravitating towards something that forceful personalities will go on to say, hey, we don't like this, therefore, we don't want to hear it. Quite frankly, it's all nonsense. Now, you know, listen, in most cases, should we be surprised? Of course not. He isn't surprised and neither am I. It doesn't mean to say that I agree with everything that's going on in our political climate, but it means that, you know what, some of us can understand it. And you can, and you can understand why liberals, and even on the side of Piers Morgan, are getting it so horribly wrong. Now listen, folks, I'll be the first one to tell you. I have my, my serious concerns about liberals just like I have my serious concerns about conservatives. Being Latino, you grew up predominantly in a very conservative household. You taught about religion at a very young age. You taught about values, norms, and beliefs that tend to sort of consume our daily living. 
whether it's our parents, our extended family, yes, we tend to sort of maybe grow up a little bit conservative. And there are some values and norms and beliefs that yes, I still retain. But as I said earlier, I tend to be center right. I can be right on some issues, I can lean a little bit to the left on some issues, or just be in the middle. But that's one of the things we have to sort of look at. And this is where Piers Morgan is right. This sort of toxicity that's sort of embodying the left, whether it's here in the United States or even worldwide, it's not healthy. The idea of telling you what to think, how to think, and what and when to think just is not constructive. The idea that, hey, if we don't like what you have to say, the first instinct is to demonize you, to smear you, to label you. Folks, that just isn't productive in today's political discourse. It just isn't. As an educator, I know firsthand the importance of being able to talk about things, about the sort of the significance of discourse, being able to have differing opinions, being able to at least encourage students at any grade level to talk about today's political climate, sociological climate, economic climate, or even social climate. These are things we need, folks. And for whatever reason, at least here in the United States, to a certain segment of the American left, that just isn't possible. But sort of going back with Piers Morgan, he also went on to say that, listen, what, liber what many liberals want to do, not just in England and in Europe, but throughout the world, is that they just want to tell people not just how to sort of lead their lives, but at the same time, if you don't lead lives the way we tell you to, it's kind of a version of, a version of fascism. And he's right. The idea of imposing views on you, whether you like it or not, folks, that just isn't democratic. It's not American. It's not embracing liberty and freedom and democracy, things we all learned at a very young age that, quite frankly, come to embody our society, not just 243 years ago with the formation of our democracy, but even today in 2019. These are things that just are not healthy for us. And you know what? At the same time, when we talk about many liberals in society, what's the prescription? They're going to hound you. They're going to hound your family and friends. They're going to demonize you. They'll make you out to be perhaps the most disgusting person in your workplace, in your family, anywhere in the public arena. And honestly, that just is not productive. And, you know, and when I think about what liberals are doing to society today, hey, listen, like I said, I have my fair arguments and I have my fair concerns about conservatives. There are some conservatives out there that, quite frankly, don't sit well with me whether they're trying to shove religion down your throat or a specific moral or ethical code in our faces every day, listen, I can object to it and I can be intellectually honest and say, you know what, I may not agree with that. But folks, when we talk about this fixation on victimhood, on political correctness, on the idea uh, that identity politics is healthy, on just pushing victimhood, folks, what is this accomplishing? It's not accomplishing anything. It's making us divided. It's making us sort of polarized. And most importantly, folks, it's adding to a toxicity that we don't need. There's enough toxicity among us each and every day. Why add to it when it comes to ideology? And tragically, that's what's happened to our political discourse. And that's what's being reduced to. And it's sad. But you know what? You can, th you can thank liberals for that. Because quite frankly, there's no one else to blame in 2019. And that's what I'm thinking about right now. After returning from summer break, Talk on the Hudson resumed this week on Blog Talk Radio, and my guest was certified recovery advocate and national fitness expert, Jolene Ballard. She had a lot to say, not only about substance abuse, the awareness and the stigma that comes with it, but also some solutions that can be very practical for those struggling with addiction each and every day. First and foremost, we talked about sort of the, the problem of substance abuse and obviously some of the opinions concerning marijuana and marijuana legalization. Let's see what she had to say. And, you know, mm -hmm. drug usage in New Jersey is still as high as it's ever been. Um, I mean, we'll get into some, I think, some d discrepancies in our criminal justice system that I think uh, need to be rectified. But before we get to that, uh, it seems that even, you know, public opinion polls seem to be swaying, Jolene. And you're a mother, so obviously I think it's conversations that I'm sure you'll have to have uh, with your son at some point. But it seems that public opinion is swaying in such a way that, one particular aspect of, of drug usage, recreationally speaking, and, and I'm talking about marijuana, seems to be gaining a favorable sort of wind, right? Like, sort of like when you look at the wind on the ocean, it seems like the currents are going one way. It seems like a lot of people are telling us that marijuana usage is on the rise, where she states legalized it. Only five, but other states have decriminalized it. It seems like people find – I'm uh, sorry, let me, let me rephrase this. It seems like the stigma that once existed about marijuana isn't there anymore. 
and maybe that's leading more and more people to just use it, whether it's for medicinal purposes or just recreationally. How do you feel about that? Because I know about your standards when it comes to substance abuse and drug usage. Um, you know, it's it's challenged for me. Um, I'm on the cusp of both sides of it. You know, I have friends that um, I personally don't use marijuana, but I think it, it reacts in the brain differently. So some people can get, you know, they can smoke marijuana, it relaxes them. People use it for mental health. If they have anxiety or depression, they will smoke marijuana and it evens them out in a way that um, you know, an antidepressant normally would. And other people can extend extremely paranoid and even more anxious. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's on, I'm on the fence with it. I, I do think that it's safer to grow marijuana and have it be clean versus what they're selling on the street, which is laced with a whole bunch of other stuff, which makes it that much more addicting. Marijuana itself is not an addictive drug, but what they sell on the street when it's laced with things will become an addictive drug. Moving along, we talked about discussing the removal of stigma as it pertains to substance abuse, as tens of thousands of New Jerseyans struggle with it on a daily basis. Certainly, she provides some insightful sort of advice when it comes to remedies that will help address drug abuse, some of the inequities that exist in our criminal justice system, and more importantly, what you can do on a daily basis to help those around you that are struggling with addiction. Let's check it out. Means, and we know that yes, the stigma with marijuana has, has has lessened tremendously. You know, science and medicine obviously are on the side of people that would argue that hey, the only real good reason to legalize it recreationally is if the government regulates it. it as you said, and obviously, you know, and, and science tells us that it's not going to be laced with chemicals or anything else that could be harmful. If we're talking about sort of natural cannabis. Uh, that can have a lot of medicinal benefits and physical benefits, as you mentioned, for, for anxiety, for pain management. I know a lot of people that have become reliant on CBD oils and things of that nature, right. and that industry has grown, and that industry has grown. But even though we've seen these strides and we've seen science and medicine sort of come out in favor of marijuana, it just seems, though, Jolene, that, you know, here in New Jersey, more so than anywhere in the country, the opioid crisis is it's not even at an alarming level it is at a catastrophic level and i don't mm-hmm. really know who sh- who should share the blame here but it's something that quite honestly and I, listen as an academic i always like to think there's a solution to everything if you sit down and, and look at policy i don't know if there's something that can be done about opioids in new jersey or nationally uh, jolene and from your experience talking with with clients that you've had or people that you've worked with um you know, is there any hope on the horizon? Um, well, I want to just go back to the marijuana um, conversation that we were having. And, you know, the uh, Drug and Alcohol, National Drug and Alcohol Center has decided that um, the gateway drug is not marijuana, which is what we learned growing up, but it's actually alcohol. Alcohol is the first drug that most people will use, and alcohol is a drug, even though it is legal, and, you know, they did try to outlaw it. And, and it's the same situation with marijuana. People will always find their hands you know, a way to get their hands on it. So if we can find a way to regulate it and make it safe, then I think that, I, you know, I would support that. Um, but going back into what we were just talking about, which is the epidemic of opioids in this country, it is at an all-time high. I mean, we are literally looking at over 80 people dying per day across the country. Um, and as far as the resolution goes, yes, I think the government, um, or there's personal lawsuits against the uh, family that started the Oxycontin. Um, I was literally told by one person who start who had never had a drug problem in his whole life, took Oxycontin for pain relief, had surgery, and was prescribed Oxycontin, and within six weeks became a full blown addict and was selling it. That is how strong and how serious um, you know the pain uh, medications that are being handed out or were handed out like candy years ago should be taken. It is completely deadly. It is serious. It will destroy your life. And I honestly have to say there is very little chance of coming back. Once you are addicted to opioids or heroin, which is, you know, the progression, um, the chances of recovery are slim to none. Um, And it really does lead you down this destructive path. So I would say for people in the age group, the demographic of maybe 
30 to 55. If they are addicted to heroin, it's basically because they started with pain medication that was prescribed to them by a doctor legally. Um, I had one story I interviewed a woman who became prescribed, uh, addicted to benzos. The doctor prescribed it to her for depression, and she has not been able to recover in 10 years and has switched to drugs, um, illegal drugs, just cannot get sober. And as far as the heroin epidemic, that's more of a younger generation. And I think that there's waves and cycles. You know, every uh, generation tries a different drug. For some reason, heroin has made a comeback since the 70s. Um, And, you know, people are dying, and it should be taken seriously. And I think the one thing that I'd love to talk about tonight is the stigma of addiction. How do we look at people And instead of looking at them like they're losers and junkies and label them, labeling them with all these awful names, can we not start to look at them with a compassionate eye of, holy cow, this is something that could happen to anyone in my family. And it's gotten to the point where one out of eight people are now facing an addiction problem. And it is a disease. It's chronic. It's progressive. It's fatal. And that is what the American Medical Association has defined as disease over 50 years ago. Not only is Jolene Ballard a certified recovery advocate fighting for the rights of, of, of addicts and those suffering from substance abuse on a, on a daily basis, but she's also, a, again, a nationally renowned fitness expert. And as we all know, the summer months are over, and as the cold temperatures are approaching, some of us might get a little bit lazy when it comes to sort of maintaining our figures and staying healthy. Without a doubt, she had a lot to say about what is the, probably the most productive way to stay healthy, to keep working out, and again, to close out 2019 in the healthiest way possible. Let's see what she had to say about it. Think about that. We're going into the holiday season. Is this the time for you to be stationary? If you're not going to go to the gym, when's the best time not to do, go to the gym? Spring and summer, right? Because you're outside a lot, you're active. Sure. But in the winter, the fall and winter, you start to hibernate. And that's when you pack on the pounds. And in women, if you're listening, every year as you age, you lose about 1.4 pounds of muscle. And what it, as women, as we lose muscle, what do we, you know, what do we adapt? Osteoporosis. We start to hunch over in our 60s and 70s. Um, so it's something to be mindful of. But also being fit gives you so much more energy during the day. It helps you sleep better at night. It helps you make better choices. Um, And also, you just feel more agile and ready to go. So here's my tips for you. Number one, come see me in Equinox and Darien. I will give you two complimentary personal training sessions. (laughs) But outside of that, go to your local gym. Go to the gym that you're working out at and say, can I get a complimentary personal training session? Go meet with a fitness expert. We We go through so many certifications, years of training to deliver to our clients the most important information that they can learn about their bodies. And the body is what we have, you know, it's, it's like everything that we are. So everything you eat is a example or resemblance of what you are or what you eat. And also like, you know, respect your body, know that it can go further than what you think it can. Your brain will always tap out in a class or in a workout more than your faster than your body will. So you never have to worry about going into aerobic or anaerobic stages, um, getting breathless. That's your fat burning zone. That's where you want to be. But you, most people that are beginners or, or intermediate stages really need an expert to help them guide them through those sessions. It's an investment that you will put into yourself. Okay, now based but on I that, also so talk Jordan, about yeah. that real quick with people. Like I think I mentioned that a little bit about people in recovery. You know, find a way. So many people in the industry are actually people that are in recovery because they find a way to, you know, take their bodies to work in a different way. Instead of, you know, destroying it or beating it up with drugs or alcohol, they've learned to take that energy and that passion, focus it and hone it in on building the best them that they can be. Undoubtedly, she had a lot to say. It was very educational, very informative, as well as illuminating. You can surely listen to the episode in its entirety by going to www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash Talk in the Hudson. You can listen to it from any PC, Mac, smartphone, or tablet, whether you do it online or listen to it live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Blog Talk Radio. Once again, Jolene Ballard, an exceptional guest, talking about the issues affecting those struggling with substance abuse, but more importantly, trying to get us healthy, trying to get us fit, and trying to keep us active, which you know what? 
In today's crazy and busy times, quite often, we don't have a chance to either go to the gym or even maintain the healthiest of lifestyles. Thank goodness for people like Jolene Ballard, because you know what? She's keeping us fit and she's keeping us sane. Now on to some local stories and one that should really capture our eye because of how dependent we've become on New Jersey Transit. In recent news, as it just reported by the Hudson Reporter this past week, New Jersey Transit will indeed hold public hearings to hear feedback from the general public and from commuters who are so adversely affected by sort of the dysfunction that's come to embody New Jersey Transit. Now again, uh, as recently reported this week, New Jersey Transit will hold two public hearings to gather information and feedback, making permanent some of the crucial cuts that we've been seeing with some expanded bus service, not only in parts of North Jersey, but specifically here in Hudson County, which include the number 119 bus routes, which include Bayonne, Jersey City, and even routes into Manhattan. And of course, much of the debate around New Jersey Transit circulates around implementing a proposed new premium fare on the express service between the Port Authority bus terminal, in New York, and the new American Dream Complex coming and hopefully opening in October of this year down in East Rutherford across from MetLife Stadium. Now recently on August 31st, New Jersey Transit added pilot weekend and weekday evening services to bus routes 772 to accommodate customers interested in employment as well as recreational services at the soon to be opened American Dream Mall again in East Rutherford. Now, evening services have been extended along the line up until 10.20 p.m., and even Saturday and Sunday services will operate approximately every 30 minutes between the hours of 8.30 a.m. and 10.30 p.m. Now, on September 1st, the Jersey Transit reported that a pilot program was added on to Sunday services, including the bus route number 119, operating between Bayonne, Jersey City, and New York City, operating every hour throughout most of the day and every two hours during the late night and early morning hours. Now the schedule is set to remain the same during the current Saturday service. So, but even beginning on October the 25th, New Jersey Transit will operate express bus services from New York City to the American Dream Complex. Now, now the new bus route labeled number 355 will operate daily from the, from the Port Authority bus terminal to the American Dream Complex every 30 minutes to accommodate employees and visitors to the mall alike. Now, New Jersey Transit proposes to establish, on a pilot basis, though, a premium bus fare for this frequent express bus service. In addition to these presentations and the proposals being made, public hearings will serve as a reminder that the commuters want to hold New Jersey Transit, its executive board, and the overall functionality of it to task. Now, again, the public hearings will be held on October the 3rd from 5 p.m. until 7 p.m. at the Journal Square Transportation Service in Midtown section of Jersey City. Again, they're located at the One Path Plaza along the concourse level. Also, there'll be an, another public hearing taking place on October 7th from 5 p.m. until 7 p.m. nearby at the Bergen County Freeholders Office on the fifth floor public meeting room at One Bergen Plaza in Hackensack, New Jersey. Now again, for those, of you, for those of you that will be unable to attend the hearings and or wish to provide feedback or even written comments for New Jersey Transit and their executive board, Submissions can be accepted on the New Jersey Transit website. Again, www.newjerseytransit.com forward slash public hearing forward slash bus. Or you can send them to the public hearing office, which is located on the ninth floor of New Jersey Transit at 1 Penn Plaza East in Newark, New Jersey, 07105. Again, all comments have to be submitted no later than midnight on October the 7th. Folks, an invaluable service here for, for commuters who still struggle on a daily basis with what New Jersey Transit provides. We'll see if these public hearings have any effect on what happens on the day-to-day -day operations of New Jersey's largest commuter rail system. Another local story that should capture your attention was the special needs school in the south side of Jersey City, which recently not only suffered a closure, but also a roof collapse endangering students on the premises and also sort of endangering the functionality of the institution overall. Now again, as recently reported in the Jersey Journal, New Jersey, New Jersey City University's A. Harry Moore School will be closed until further notice following an inspection of the building and at the same time after the roof collapsed in front of the building according to school officials. Now the School for Special Needs Children and Young Adults closed after the roof located above the entrance of the building collapsed due to water damage this recent week. Now again, quote, according to the Jersey City Board of Education, the safety and security of the students attending the HAM programs is the, of the utmost priority for the Jersey City Board of Education, according to 
JCBOE president, Sudan Thomas. Quote, they'll continue working with New Jersey University, which operates the school to explore any alternate arrangements for the interim. Now, Hudson County architects and engineers, respectively, inspected the collapsed roof and have determined that though the water, even though water came through the, the structure itself, the roof does not seem to be in any permanent danger for any further collapse, according to Hudson County spokesman James Kennelly. Now, of course, further testing has to be done to ensure that this collapse won't happen again and to make sure that any accommodations or any repairs that need to be implemented as soon as possible do indeed get done. And without a doubt, folks, it's not only the fact that the A. Mary Mar School is for children with multiple physical, medical, and cognitive disabilities. It helps more than 140 children between the ages of 3 and 21 to attend the school, and again, according to the website, doing so on a yearly basis. Now, the programs and therapies offered there at the school are run by New Jersey City University, which leases a facility on Canada Boulevard from the Jersey City School District. Now, unfortunately, the school itself is facing some funding problems and subsequently will be facing closure altogether. So notwithstanding sort of the structural problems that we saw this past week with the collapse of the roof, we're also seeing that funding could indeed endanger the future of the school itself. Folks, I can't tell you enough how important this school is for parents and for children of like, for children that are suffering from multiple disabilities, again, whether it be cognitive, physical, or medical, and how imperative this school is for local residents, not just in like, nearby Jersey City, but for residents that could, are able to attend the school altogether. Listen, we have to help our kids, especially those with any sort of disability. Whether it comes to learning, hey, everyone learns on their own pace, but the more important thing, and the important thing here really about the A. A. Harry Moore School is that they perform such an exceptional public service to the kids that they service every single year. More importantly, giving parents a relief because it has to be exhausting, it has to be stressful, and it has to be just laborious to be able to deal with the stressors every day. But what the A. Harry Moore School is doing is helping these kids and helping them develop functionality and to be just, again, to, to appreciate learning, to enjoy it. And you know what? When we see schools like this closing down, all I can say is I hope that the Jersey City Board of Edu Education, that the City Council, and Jersey City Mayor Stephen Fulop kind of get their act together and make sure that the funding that this school needs presents itself. It's too important and it's doing a disservice to our kids. You know what? Education should be, av be available to everybody, regardless of any cognitive disability or any other physical impairment or m medical or mental impairment that students may face. They don't deserve it. They deserve our attention, they deserve our love, and they deserve our support. Jerry City, I hope you're listening, and I hope that the A. High Mary Moore School can reopen sometime soon. Well, that's what this week's edition of Talking Politics, folks. Again, if you uh, wish to check out all the ex exceptional programming offered by the Hudson Media Group, check it out, www.hmgtvshows.com and also at www.livestream.com forward slash hmgtv. Again, check it out. Make sure to follow Hudson Media Group on Twitter, on Instagram, and also like them on Facebook. If I'm talking politics, I'm doing it right here with the Hudson Media Group. I'm Fernando Uribe. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to catch Fernando's podcast at blogtalkradio.com slash talk on the Hudson.